Good morning, everybody. Uh, and I'm thinking both of our colleagues down in Regina, as well as uh, the uh, group that's assembled here at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, I just introduce myself, first of all. My name is uh, Maurice Maloney, and I am the uh, Executive Director and Chief Executive of the Global Institute for Food Security. Uh, I arrived relatively recently, uh, at the end of October, so I'm still getting to know the campus and the people on campus, but one of the people that I have got to know through uh, being on a, a number of uh, committees together is Murray, and so it is a, a great pleasure to, uh, to introduce uh, Murray this morning. Uh, as you know, Murray is uh, um, uh, an e ag agricultural and, and food economist um, and a professor at Johnson Shoyama um, Graduate School of Public Policy. Um, he's specialized in a number of important areas that overlap with our interests uh, as a, an institute for food security, um, certainly on issues uh, around uh, um, biotechnology, the, both the economics, the ethics, and the uh, and public perception of biotechnology. Um, uh, he's also uh, a researcher in uh, cooperatives. In fact, I was just finding out a little bit of some of the work they're doing in China, which is uh, very exciting. Um, and uh, he uh, has uh, um, numerous publications around the area of food security. And today, um, it's a very good opportunity to, to discuss um, the, the various aspects that impinge upon global food security. As a, as a scientist, a biologist, and a geneticist, of course, I always think that it's all about what we do in the lab and in the field and the development of varieties. But of course, um, uh, every so often we all come to our senses, even as scientists, and realize that public policy, international affairs, um, and um, uh, societal acceptance of various things um, plays just as much of a role uh, in all aspects of, uh, of food security. So it is with great pleasure I introduce uh, Murray Fulton and uh, the title of his uh, seminar today is Why Food Security is Determined by Elites, Price Spikes and Vietnam's Rice Policy. Murray. Good. Um, Boris, thank you very much for that um, very kind introduction. Um, the, um, let me just uh, sort of jump right into this. This is uh, some research that um, I've been working on now for, Travis, what is it, about four years? Um, and and my, my co-author is um, sitting here, uh, Travis Reynolds, um, who's a PhD student in the Johnson Shyama Graduate School of Public Policy. And um, this, this particular paper really brings together um, a number of the, the things that I've be, been interested in both now and um, his sort of in the past. Um, I've, uh, as, as you just found out about me, I've long um, had an interest in things agricultural. Um, I've written some stuff about trade. I've written stuff about uh, genetically modified uh, foods, biotechnology. Um, and, um, uh, but more recent, so that's, that's always been an interest. More recently, I've uh, begun to be um, interested in two additional sort of areas, one um, kind of a methodological perspective of behavioral um, economics. And you're going to see some of that behavioral economics show up um, in, in this. And um, since moving to the School of Public Policy, I've been able to um, move into an area that's always fascinated me, which is political economy. And you're going to see a, a, a real um, uh, emphasis on um, the political economy of Vietnam um, in this particular presentation. Um, and really bring um, these concepts from political economy and behavioral economics to bear on this issue of food security um, and try to give you a sense of, of why this is um, in, such, in, in many ways such a complicated um, problem. So let me just start off by giving you a bit of a picture of what has happened to rice prices. So this is a little case study of, of Vietnam um, and rice. Um, and we'll talk about to the extent that you can generalize from this particular case. Um, but this is what's happened to rice prices for about the last 15 years. Um, this goes back to 2000. Um, these are in nominal prices. So these are the prices that people were actually seeing on, on the day. Um, they, they haven't been adjusted for inflation. And if you take a look here, it's pretty obvious that 
uh, you know, the early 2000s, things were bumping along. Um, prices were going up roughly about the rate of inflation. So they would have, in real terms, they've been actually pretty flat. Um, and then all of a sudden, bang, uh, this dramatic price spike in 2007. And then, um, since then, it, it's come back down again, um, and um, not quite as stable, but um, you know, back to some level of stability. So that's, um, that's what's happened over the last 15 years. And of course, we want to zero in on that, uh, that price spike in 2007, 2008. And this particular price spike has, um, it's got lots of implications, but one of the, the implications I want to talk about today is the implications for food security. And um, it has um, significant implications on that uh, regard. Um, this particular price jump is estimated to have driven about 130 uh, million people uh, into poverty, um, with another um, 75 million more becoming um, malnourished. So this is a, th these are significant events. Um, and um, one of the things I think we need to think about is what can we do to kind of mitigate um, these kinds of um, um, spikes. Now, people, as soon as this spike was, was when it was obvious that this spike was going on, um, people started looking for what were the causes. And there's a whole list. Um, I've actually missed one from here. The Australian drought is not on here, and it should be. Um, the, um, and I'm not, going to go, I'm not going to talk about these. These all played um, a bit of a role, though I think most commentators would say that these were all background um, things. Um, the big one that's missing is the Australian drought, which kind of kicked it. And then the last one, the export restrictions, exacerbated um, it and made it much, much more worth, worth, worse um, than it would have been otherwise. So it kind of multiplied it up. Um, and um, what happened was that as export restrictions went on, and I'm going to talk about this um, a little bit, as export restrictions went on, um, that caused the price to go up more. And the more that the price went up, the more that uh, countries felt that they needed to put export restrictions on. Um, and so it just fed itself. Um, and um, it eventually collapsed. Um, and you can see uh, that price spike then collapsed. Um, so if go back to there, it then um, fell. Um, and that was because that price rise um, uh, actually encouraged farmers around the world um, to grow more rice. Um, and within um, a couple of growing seasons, uh, the rice um, supply was back into um, something close to um, a balance with demand. So I'm going to uh, focus particularly on this exacerbation that was going on. Why do we see countries reacting um, policy-wise um, in the way that they did around export restrictions? So part of this is to just actually look at export bans. And they're actually much, much more common um, than you would think. Um, this is just a little um, sort of illustration of the bans that have been on in the last sort of 10 years, um, and there's quite a few. Um, every time that you see kind of a, a, a spike or a kind of particular country um, experiencing a shortfall, um, such as uh, Russia did in 2012, or Ukraine, um, uh, at least in some of these regimes, uh, you see um, restrictions then on of exports. Um, Argentina has been in a sort of almost semi-permanent um, export ban um, since 2006. Um, now, of course, we don't see these in, um, say, the OECD countries. So Canada, the United States, Australia, uh, uh, we're not seeing these things. And so that, in part, suggests that there's something um, about the nature of the political economy um, that may be at, at work. So um, I'm, I'm going to focus particularly on Vietnam in 2007 and 2008. And, but I'm going to be asking the question, can the insights from this analysis shed any light on these other cases as well? Um, so let's think about what might motivate um, bans. And um, um, I'm an economist, and so one of the things that economists tend to ask is, um, what's the motivation? What's the incentive? Um, who's, um, whose interests are at work, and why are they making the decisions that, um, that they are? 
So let's take a look at um, what motivates bans. Um, if we go to, to uh, January of 2012, this is um, a quote from um, um, a vice president of a trading company in India. Um, and just so you know, this is January. They've just lifted the ban that they had put on in, to, in 2011. Okay, so um, they just had a ban, um, and then they'd lifted it. And um, this guy's saying, India will not think of a ban until it fears that local prices are going to increase. Um, the rice crop is good in India and other countries, and the global prices may remain stable. So this suggests that what they're looking at would be something about domestic prices, um, that, that there's a, a concern about domestic prices. Um, and the ban is if it was put in place was to somehow deal with that. Um, and by the way, that comes up over and over and over again. That's just a nice um, illustration of it. Um, if we go back to 2008 and take a look at the case of Vietnam, um, here we have the uh, Deputy Minister of Industry and Trade um, saying, and this is a little bit more nuanced, and, um, this is actually really quite um, illustrative, I think, saying um, the export ban would help reduce the quantity but increase the value and export revenue, okay? Uh, while ensuring food security, so that's um, a kind of domestic prices, and serving the state's interests, okay? And what I'm going to argue here is that this is, um, um, the state's interest is a euphemism um, for the interest of a particular group within the state um, namely, um, the elite. Okay? And, um, and then he goes on to point that, that in fact, uh, this wasn't a complete export ban, that there had been some recent shipments to um, the Philippines, um, and um, they had um, obtained a very um, high price for that particular shipment. Okay? Um, and this is going to also figure into the um, analysis. So, um, with that as kind of background, here's the take-home message, so that if any of you say, gee, I don't want to hear anything more from Murray, um, you, can, um, you can take off, okay? Um, what I want to argue is that what you're seeing here in, in the case of Vietnam is um, the, the, the groups that, are, that actually have um, the power and the authority to be able to determine um, export policy are um, have chosen that policy to, in a way that's <clears throat> beneficial to them, both economically and politically. They're doing it to both retain their political power, and they're doing it to um, earn themselves some extra, what we as economists call rent, um, which is um, you know, something better than the next best alternative that I could have got. Okay? Um, and that... Um, that that's what's behind, um, at least in Vietnam, that's what's behind these export bans. Okay. Now, what 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 of course is going on is that these prices. I mean, I talked about this earlier. These um, these export bans then um, exacerbate um, the price volatility, um, which then feeds back into the system. But this is actually a very calculated um, decision on the part of the elite within these countries. Um, and I'll talk about who, these, who this elite is in just a moment, but that's the, um, the take home message. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Um, I, I was aware today that I wouldn't be necessarily talking to um, economists, um, so I thought I would just talk a little bit about how economists sort of approach these problems. And um, this particular piece of research, and um, by the way, uh, Travis and I uh, just heard here about a month ago that um, this paper will be forthcoming in the American Journal of Agricultural Economics. Um, so um, this has um, now been accepted for publication. Um, this particular work, and, and I, this characterizes a fair bit of my work, um, would fall into a category of something that, that we, as economists, call um, applied theory, if that's not an oxymoron. Um, and what, what, we, what applied theory is, is I've tried to capture it in this little um, diagram. So the, we start with a model. Um, and the model has um, some assumptions about what the motivation of, the, of agents are. And in this case, the agents are going to be two, two particular groups, consumers and the elite within Vietnam, um, the elite in charge of, of the food, um, of, of rice exports. 
And the model also contains um, something I'm going to call institutional constraints. What is possible within this environment? So these agents can't run around and do anything that they want. Um, they're constrained in what um, is possible. But we, what we, we have to identify the agents and we have to say, what are they interested in? Are they interested in power? Are they interested in uh, the rents that they get or um, whatever? Okay. With that, we then do lots of fun math and we come up with predicted outcomes. And those predicted outcomes really say, this is how we think um, the agents are going to behave, the various groups um, are going to behave. And then what we need to do is compare that to what we actually observe, the real behavior of these agents, and see what kind of congruence there is. Okay? And what we're doing is we're trying to, to see, do these assumptions and constraints end up giving us predicted outcomes that are relatively close? Because if they are, then we come back and say, okay, this model might have some um, applicability elsewhere. Okay? Um, assuming that we can think about the same agents with the same motivations and the same sort of institutional constraints. Now, we're always aware that um, there are different models that could give different outcomes. And so in some sense, we've chosen one and there are, there are other alternatives that are possible. Okay? Um, and so um, this doesn't mean that, um, that the, you know, this is proof that this is the right model. It's a model, um, I'm going to argue, that does work, that on this diagram, this congruence between the prediction and the, um, and the actual um, is pretty close. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's the only model. There may be others. Okay? But I am, I am going to take a look at one of, the, one of the models that's out there as a sort of um, um, explanatory um, uh, vehicle, and I'm going to suggest that its predicted outcomes actually don't match up um, very well at all, and um, what the consequence of that particular way of viewing the world uh, might be. So I'm going to start at sort of at the back end of this and look at the observed outcomes, and then I'm going to go through the model, um, and then we're going to go to the predicted outcomes. Okay, so that's how um, this is going to... So this is, this is what we actually observed in Vietnam. Um, this from 1986 up to 2007. Um, this is the price of rice at the border. So this is the price that the Vietnam, the, so exports coming from Vietnam, that's the price um, at the border as it's leaving Vietnam for rice. And it's bumping along here nice and flat. And then um, you can just see those two little dots way up here. Okay, That's the price spike. Um, and it doesn't go all the way up to, to $1,000 a ton, as we saw in the other diagram, because this is an average for the year rather than um, the actual um, than, you know, prices by month. Um, and so on average, it was um, someplace in that range. And what you see at that particular point is that those bars switch from being above to being below. And those those bars are what's called the nominal rate of assistance. And they really describe um, how much, um, to what degree are farmers being taxed um, or subsidized, okay? Um, and um, when the bars are above the, the, the line, farmers are being subsidized. They're receiving a price that's greater than the, essentially the world price, okay? If the bars are below, they're receiving a price that's below the world price, um, and they're being taxed because they could have got something um, higher. So what you see here is that the export ban goes on um, at um, at exactly so, and, and what's driving those prices below? So what what's making those um, bars um, to be uh, below the line rather than above? Um, the reason for that taxation is that um, there is an export um, restriction in place, okay? Um, and so just very simple economics, what happens if you restrict the exports um, out of Vietnam, you've got extra uh, product now um, on the Vietnamese market. That's driving down the price because there's extra supply, so it drives down the price. And if there wasn't an export ban, of course, what you'd expect one of the traders to do is to say, gee, I could buy it really cheap in Vietnam now. 
um, I'm going to buy it in Vietnam and export it, say, to the Philippines, um, where they're willing to pay $1,200 um, a ton, um, and I could make a lot of money. Um, and you'd, you'd expect to get arbitrage. But the government actually closed the border and said no, um, no exports, at least for most um, firms other than the ones I'm going to talk about here in a minute. Um, and so um, that arbitrage was prevented. Um, and um, um, that's why you're seeing that, um, uh, th that lower price. Now, um, and th this is what, so this is what we have to explain, um, is um, why would th the government put on export bans at precisely the time that the price uh, jumps? So I'm going to be focusing on that latter period. This earlier period, I need to point out, is I think a very different regime in um, Vietnam. Um, sometime in the later, latter part of the 1990s, Vietnam makes the decision that it's going to try to become a, a member of the World Trade Organization. And it changes its policies. Um, and this period back here in the late 80s, early 90s, is a period when they're not um, subject to any kind of anticipated um, joining of the WTO. Um, and this gives a different set of institutional constraints and therefore um, needs a different um, framework to, to, to think about. So we're just focusing on this, um, this latter period. All right, so that's the observed outcomes. Um, I'm gonna go back now to the assumptions of the model um, and just sort of quickly go through um, what the motivational assumptions and the institutional constraints are that are um, important here. Um, there's four of them that we're going to talk about. The volatility of the grain market, the psychology of gains versus losses, this is behavioral economic stuff, the structure of Vietnam's rice policy, and Vietnam's um, political economy. And we have to actually understand all these things before we can actually sort of construct um, the model. So here we go. What we need to understand, not just about rice, but about any of these uh, agricultural commodities, is what's the nature of the price uh, of, of prices um, and how are prices determined? Um, I happen to have very handy corn, wheat, and soybean prices, um, and so I use those. Rice will look very, very much like this. What's great about this is this is 90 years of prices, okay, and um, you can see some interesting patterns there. And rather than take a look at this, um, I'm going to give you a quote from Brian Wright. Um, Brian's at the University of California, Berkeley, um, done a lot of work on, on, on storage and um, grain prices. And this is what he says. Grain price volatility exhibits a special pattern with two key features. First, price fluctuations occur against a longer-term backdrop of a downward price trend during the period 1950 to 2001, and a flattening out of prices during the early 2000s. Okay, it's exactly what you see here. Okay, and then second, against this backdrop, episodes of sharp price spikes followed by precipitous falls. Okay. Um, interspersed by longer intervals of less extreme variation. And the price series are asymmetric. There are no steep troughs to match the spikes. Okay, so just think, take a look at this again. Okay, so this, you know, I think all of us knew kind of the commodity prices are, are you know, um, volatile. But I suspect most of us thought that, okay, the ups and downs would be kind of symmetric. You have lots of downs and then ups and, right? Uh -uh. You can see that there's kind of almost a floor that they're bouncing off of, and then every once in a while, the I mean, most of the time the bounces are just small, and then every once in a while there's these big bounces. Okay? And that's what um, Brian Wright's um, describing. The other thing that's true, that the other thing that's, that's, that's the case is that demand is highly elastic when prices are in... Um, their stable range or relatively stable range, but demand becomes very inelastic when prices spike. Okay, so um, and this is actually also important to, um, to the story. Now, let me just give you a, a quick um, sort of understanding of why this particular pattern um, occurs. What's the economics that are going on here? 
the reason you see them sort of bounce, prices bouncing off of this floor is that when you get down to this floor, you're getting down someplace close to what would be sort of the, the minimum cost of production, that basic cost of production. And when prices get to that stage, um, partly farmers say, well, I'm, I'm not going to sell it because I, um, but mostly it's, it's, it's traders um, in the market saying, well, if it's getting down this low, there's now a better, a better chance, a higher probability that prices are going to go up. And so rather than sell today at this slightly lower price, I'm going to buy some of this, I'm going to store some of this grain and hold it until the price does go up because there's a stronger probability that it's going to go up. Okay? And so, um, and if the price then starts to go up a little bit, guess what? They sell off their stocks, which pushes it back down again. Okay? So you do get some, some fluctuations because um, there are um, some things going on in the marketplace, but not too much. Okay? Now, at some point, um, you get a combination of factors, like a drought um, and a big increase in demand, say, for biofuels and um, a couple of things that all hit at the same time. And initially what happens is that uh, traders release their stocks onto the market, and then at some point the price keeps going up and they've released all their stocks and they have no more stocks um, to dispose of. And at that point, there's nothing to curtail that price rise. And that's what you see, that's what you see with these big price spikes. This is what occurred in the early 1970s, 1971, 72. It, this is what occurred in um, 2007, 2008. Um, you get these what are called stockouts. Um, and uh, there's, there's no more storage to be put onto the market. What happens at this point is that demand becomes very inelastic because the only people that are buying product now are consumers that need it for food. The rest of the time, you get traders in the market buying food, um, buying it for storage. Um, now you've only got consumers, and they need this rice um, to live. Um, and this makes demand become very inelastic. Um, you can raise the price, and you don't see much of a, of a cutback in demand. Okay? So um, that's, um, that's the nature of the, of the grain market. Um, and we're going to see why that's important down the road. All right, the second thing we need to take a look at is the psychology of gains and losses. Um, imagine, and let's talk about consumers here. Imagine that you're a consumer and that you're seeing this, this, this price fluctuation of rice. Um, and rice is, a, um, you're a relatively low income consumer of rice. Um, and um, you're seeing um, these sort of day-to-day -day fluctuations of, of rice and you, you can get by. And then all of a sudden you see a very sharp rise in the price of rice, which means that you are experiencing a loss, essentially a loss of income because um, you really can't buy anything else now with, um, uh, with the, the income that you have. So how do, you, how do people interpret, how do they psychologically um, deal with gains versus losses? Well, it turns out that there's a very there's a big difference in terms of how we get, how we deal with gains versus losses. Um, if we um, if we take a look at this diagram, if we're in what's called a domain of gain, um, if we get something, um, we experience an increase in value. So this gain here gives us this increase in the value of that gain. Um, and just to take a very ordinary example, but this is one that's been done with students as, um, as an experiment. If you give people a chocolate bar, okay, they'll say, oh, good, I got a chocolate bar. Um, that's worth something to me. Okay? This is how much that chocolate bar was worth to them when you gave it to them. Okay? Now, on the other hand, if you took the chocolate bar away from them, if, 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 it, if you started the experiment with everybody having chocolate bars, and you come along and say, I'm going to take your chocolate bar. Okay? So they lose the chocolate bar. The value of that loss is much, much bigger than what they gained from getting the chocolate bar. Okay? We value losses much, much more dramatically or much more significantly than we value gains. Okay? Um, and this has been shown over and over and over again. Okay? 
um, as, as being a, a, a phenomenon. Marketers use this, um, the way that they um, 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 set up um, pricing schemes and so forth are all um, around this particular phenomenon. Now, where this becomes important for our story is that imagine now you're this consumer that's just experienced this loss of income because of the, of the rise in the price of, uh, of rice. This is the loss of income that you've experienced, okay? which could be, for, for these people, very significant. Okay? Um, but the way that they value it psychologically is even bigger than that. It's multiples um, times. And this, this actually creates, this is an important part of this political economy story, because what we argue in our paper is that this creates a real concern by the political leaders in a country um, that there's going to be um, you know, people rioting in the streets over food. Okay? This is, it's this kind of psychologically, psychological phenomena that causes these kinds of um, uh, unrests um, that, we, that we saw um, around the world. Um, so at this same point in time, when rice was, uh, was spiking, uh, we had the price of corn spiking, um, there were um, demonstrations by consumers in Mexico um, over uh, the price of tortillas. Um, um, this was happening around, um, around the world. There was similar, there were demonstrations and concerns in, Italy, in India and so forth. So we need to think about this um, loss, what's called loss aversion. Okay? The third thing that we need to think about is the structure of Vietnam's rice policy, how policy is actually um, uh, undertaken. And this is a little kind of schematic to try to give you a, a sense of this. Um, what you have in Vietnam is a system where the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, along with the Ministry of Industry and Trade, and the Vietnam Food Association make a recommendation to the Prime Minister of Vietnam about the level of exports that would be looked at for the next year. So they set export targets. Okay? Um, and um, so these then are communicated to um, the grains industry. And there's, um, there's, there's actually a fairly healthy set of firms that are engaged in um, exporting of, of grain from Vietnam. Um, and they buy, they're buying rice particularly and then selling it um, internationally. Um, two of the major players in the uh, Vietnam, um, amongst the, the Vietnam uh, food exporters, are two state-owned enterprises um, called Vina Food One and Vita Food Two. Okay, um, these are these two agencies have a very very special um, relationship um, with the with this industry. Um, one is that these export targets apply to everybody else but Vina Food 1 and Vita Food 2. They don't have to abide by these export targets. Okay? They can go and make deals however they want. So if the, if the export target came back and said, we only want to export X number of tons, um, the tonnage that uh, Vina Food 1 and Vita Food 2 are um, exporting do not have to fall under that um, total ban. Okay? Um, number two, Vina Food One and Vina Food Two have a special status with certain major customers. Okay, so they are the only ones that can sell to the National Food Authority in the Philippines, uh, the Perambulog um, Agency in Indonesia, and Bernas in Malaysia. Um, so if Malaysia is buying rice from Vietnam, it's going to go through uh, Vina Food Two. Nobody else. Okay. And Vina Food One has exclusivity to Cuba and Iraq, amongst others. The other little thing that goes on here, and this is the, because of the little line between the uh, Vietnam Food Association and Vina Food Two, um, the chairperson of the Vietnam Food Association also happens to be the chairperson of Vina Food Two. Okay. Um, and one of the commentators says this is um, tantamount to putting um, the uh, fox in charge of the hen house. Okay? So the very association that's supposed to be overseeing the industry is in fact has a member um, that stands to gain um, substantially from um, that involvement. Okay? 
Um, and so what, what you saw happening during that period, latter part of 2007, early part of 2008, as the world prices were spiking, um, you, you saw the Vietnam Food Association along with these other parties making a series of export targets becoming increasingly tight. So they start off in September of 2007 um, saying, uh, we have to be a little bit careful here about how much we export, and then shrinking the amount that they're exporting so that by in January, February, March, they had, it was outright bans on the export of, of rice from Vietnam. Um, all the while, um, Vina Food 1 and Vina Food 2 are able to export um, um, you know, sort of to the heart's content. Um, so that's so that's the uh, the structure of the of the policy. Now, the final component that we need to take a look at this is um, the uh, we need to put this into a political economy framework. And the one that I'm that uh, Travis and I are using here is from Asimovu and Robinson. Um, and but there are there are other ones that are very very similar to this that that. Uh, uh, we, we could have used. Um, but this happens to be a favorite of mine these days. I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of um, Asimov and Robinson. If you haven't read some of their stuff, uh, take a look at their book called Why Nations Fail. Um, it's, a, it's, it's really a, a, a tour de force. And it's an amazing um, um, sort of take a look at, um, at the political economy of, of kind of um, every point in the world and a different time um, periods over the last sort of 500 years. What they, what they argue is that in countries where um, you have what they call um, extractive political and economic institutions, so institutions that have a significant amount of, 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 of power um, concentrated in the hands of a very, very small group of people, um, which they call an elite, um, that what you have going on is the elite um, has two sources of power. Um, they have de jure power um, as a result of the constitution and um, the rules and the, 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 the policies that are set up. And then they have de facto power based upon the resources that they can actually um, sort of bring to bear on any particular situation. The de jure and de facto power turn out uh, they can use those to influence two things. Okay? Um, they can use it to influence the political institutions. Okay? So uh, continue the, the, the current institutions the way they are, strengthen them in some ways, pass new laws that would further their, um, um, their interests, which then, of course, feed back and support the de jure power. And, of course, this keeps um, going on year after year after year. The, they also, that power is also used to influence the economic institutions and policy. And these things, economic institutions and policy, feed back in and they affect de facto power because they affect the kind of resources you have available, um, the amount of income that you're getting and so forth, as well as the economic benefits that you uh, might um, accrue from um, actually having that power. And um, so in their model, what's important is um, you know, taking a look at how um, this power is influencing these policies and how this, these policies then are feeding back up into um, the uh, retention and maintenance of, of power. But at the heart of their story is power um, and who has power and, and, and how, um, how is that um, maintained over time. And what this, what this also tells us is that we have to then take a look at, if, if we think that this is a story that we want to, that might apply to Vietnam, we actually have to take a look at uh, the institutions, the political institutions in place, the economic institutions in place, to see whether or not they actually are concentrating power um, in the hands of the people that um, we think might be um, um, in a position to make this, the decisions around food. And in this case, um, is the power being um, uh, sort of um, organized uh, in the Vietnam Food Association and in Vina Food 1 and Vina Food 2? Is, that's where, is that where it's being concentrated? So just to give you a little bit of a sense that, in fact, 
this is a plausible story for Vietnam that in fact um, there is an elite or there are elites, because I think that's the better word uh, for it. There are um, different elites within Vietnam. Um, and that Vietnam has what Asimov and Robinson would call extractive um, political and economic institutions. Um, I uh, went to some outside sources. Um, and um, in, in the paper, we have them from 1996 to 2010. I've just uh, put up a, um, a shortened version of these. Um, the Polity 2 scores, um, th this is a, a score that um, countries are ranked, um, and actually given a score on the degree to which their institutions are democratic versus um, autocratic. And anything from, it's, the, the score goes from minus 10 to plus 10. Plus 6 to plus 10 is democratic. Minus 10 to minus 6 is autocratic. Okay. So um, on that scale, Vietnam falls clearly in um, the position of an autocratic regime. Okay? Um, if you go to the voice and accountability um, ranking, this is a World Bank um, uh, scheme, that, that a ranking system that was developed. And it classifies, it takes a look at things like freedom of association, freedom of expression, the role of the media, freedom of the media, that kind of thing, okay? Um, and the scores aren't so, the estimates aren't so important. It's the ranking that's important. These are the percentiles um, from sort of zero to 100, um, with the lowest being uh, the poorest. So Vietnam scores extremely low um, on freedom of association, freedom of expression. Um, they're at the eighth percentile, ninth percentile. Uh, this is very, very low. Uh, they're amongst the lowest countries in the world um, in this regard. And then uh, the final um, measure is a, a corruption um, index. And um, again, the actual number isn't the important thing, it's the ranking. Here, Vietnam's doing a little bit better, but it's still in the bottom third, or the most, it's the, of the, all the countries, it's, the, um, it's in the top most, um, the, the top third of the most corrupt. Um, how, um, how would I put it that way? Okay, um, that's what this. Uh, that, that's what this score. So with a ranking of something like 29, 30, 30 um, 33, this puts it in the the, um, the top third of the most corrupt countries um, in the world. And the, the corruption, by the way, this is a measure particularly of how of the degree to which public power is used for private gain. Okay, so um, and this is particularly important for, um, for for what we're talking about. Um, the other final thing just to, to talk about is that Vietnam has gone through, um, if, if you've been following this, it's gone through a, a, a whole sort of privatization, um, or as this author, Painter, says, um, equitization, um, uh, uh, restructuring over the last um, sort of 20 years. But what Painter points out is that in Vietnam, this privatization is really a way of formalizing and preserving a very a, 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 a set of sort of rights um, to uh, particular parts of the economy. Um, and what they uh, they do here, um, they say this is proceeded at a pace suited to the interests of the owner managers and their state and party clients and protectors. Okay, so um, yes, there's privatization going on, um, but it's, it's proceeding um, at a pace that um, allows the state and some of its, um, uh, its affiliates um, to uh, retain power um, over this. Um, and Painter and others go on to actually uh, talk about how the structure of this privatization is very, very much in line with the colonial um, monopolies that existed um, going back to the French um, colonial days, um, which were established some, what, 300 um, years ago. So um, this structure that's, that has been introduced under privatization is actually a reflection of a structure that has been in place for, um, for actually um, centuries. 
Um, and so this, this also um, suggests a, a fair degree of control, particularly by elites, that each have their own little sort of um, area of influence. So food would be one of them, um, and particular types of food, rice um, and other types of food. Um, manufacturing would be other areas, textiles would be another area, um, and so forth. Okay. All right. So with that as background, now I get to talk about what um, the model um, looks like. Um, and this becomes a bit more abstract. Um, but um, what, what we do in the model is um, we construct it to ask, sort of deal with the following question. We say, are prices rising um, rapidly? And this, this is really um, a question that the elites um, ask themselves, the people that are in control of, of this particular situation. So this would be Vena Food 1, Vena Food 2, um, the uh, VNM Food Association. Um, are, right, are prices rising rapidly? If no, if we're bouncing along that kind of floor, okay, then um, um, the elites then have to make a decision about what they're going to do with their export tariff. Now, we've set this up as an export tariff, um, and you can, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between an export tariff and an export ban. If you put the tariff big enough, it's an outright ban. If you put a smaller tariff, it's a partial uh, ban. Okay. So, how do how do elites set their their export tariff or the ban if prices are not ri uh, rising rapidly if they're stable, or how do they set their prices if um, prices are ras rising rapidly during those price spikes? Okay. And um, what we have done is. In setting these prices, we've said these um, elites are interested in what kind of economic rents they can get. Okay? So they're worried about money, but they're also worried about power. Okay? And they're worried about maintaining power, in part to make sure that they can continue getting their economic benefits. Okay? Um, so um, the elite's ability to earn these rents depends upon them um, actually retaining power. And the other thing that we worry about is we worry about consumers' reaction um, to these price rises. Okay? And um, depending upon how consumers react, we're going to get some different outcomes then in terms of prices and, um, and so forth um, as a result of um, an export tariff being set um, if prices are rising rapidly versus here. And what, 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 we want, what we would see coming out of our model is that here we would see probably not much in terms of um, if prices aren't rising rapidly, this export tariff would be low. And over here, we would expect that we would see our model should give us that the uh, export tariff is fairly large. Okay? And what we want to do is to see whether the, the, after doing all that fun math, whether that's what you get. Um, if you actually build this in and you say, okay, these elites get to maximize their, their rents and they worry about power, what's that going to translate into in terms of export tariffs? Well, um, when, just before we get to that, we have to sort of take a look at how power works um, in this model because power is a, a critical um, feature. What we're really looking at this in this paper is if I go back to that Asimogu and Robinson framework, it's de facto power. Um, what, can they, what can they do with the resources that they have at their control to change um, the system um, sort of um, in a, a, a very immediate way? And um, what the elites have at their control is export policy. That's, the, that's their um, tool um, to um, actually uh, achieve some de facto power. And um, what is, here's how we, what we've set this thing up. Stable prices are good for the elites, okay? Um, the elites like stable uh, prices. If, if the prices are stable, let's go back to our little psychology model. If prices are stable, consumers aren't experiencing much of a loss. So they're relatively, I don't know, I'm not going to say they're happy, but they're not upset and they're not in the streets. They're not getting that, that big amount of loss. Okay? And so things are relatively stable. 
politically. Elites like this. Okay? And that allows them to hold on to power. Everyone else, okay, and I'm exaggerating slightly, um, but it, it, it works really well here. Everyone else, um, their power comes into play when prices are rising sharply. Because this is when they get they can get mobilized. Uh, they start to feel um, very, very pinched. Um, and um, this is when um, they take to the streets. And this is when um, the elites then worry about coups and overthrows of governments and um, things like that. Okay? So in terms of the balance of power, um, what elites would like to have are stable prices. And the story that, that and it's taking me sort of a long time to get here, but um, the, the story is that when you see these price rises, what the elites are, are really doing is they're saying, yeah, okay, we can fix that. We can get this price um, stable again, and we'll do that by putting a, a restriction on exports. We won't allow exports out of the country. That's going to drive down the prices and um, um, keep um, the people um, from going onto the, um, onto the streets. Now, it turned out that's the intuition turned out to actually prove that mathematically was actually quite difficult. Um, and um, I'm not going to give you um, the, um, uh, I'll, I'll skip that one. I'm not going to give you all the math because um, it's really ugly. Um, but I'm going to show you um, the outcome. Okay. So if prices are stable, what our little model shows is that this is the kind of tariff that you would put on if prices are stable. This is what the elite will do. They might put on a small tariff, um, or they'll put on a small export, some small restrictions on exports, but nothing major. Okay? When prices spike, it's one of these two curves that becomes operational. By the way, um, um, just to, let me explain this. This curve shows, the height of this curve shows the expected rents for the elites. Okay? And the elites want to maximize their expected rents. They want to get as much as they can. Okay? Now, um, they're, they're getting this in some kind of various ways. Um, so if, you know, what's really happening here is that Vena Food 1 and Vena Food 2 are um, being able to earn these rents. But um, our argument is that that, in fact, is um, uh, filtering across um, to the individuals involved. Um, that more rents for Vena Food 1, um, more rents for Vena Food 2, um, then translates into more benefits for um, the people at um, the apex of those organizations. So these are the expected rents, and they reach their highest at a very low rent, a, a very low tariff, and so um, this country, Vietnam at that point would put on a very low um, tariff. When prices spike, you move to a very high tariff. Okay? Now, um, what we've done is um, we've, we've actually tried to distinguish between what happens if consumers, um, if consumer losses do not affect power and if consumer losses do affect uh, the power of the elite. And um, if we have a low level of loss aversion, there's not too much difference. Whether consumers um, are on the streets or not, um, if, sorry, if, if um, yeah, whether consumer losses affect power or not, whether the, the, the elites worried about the, the people on the street or not, okay, um, doesn't really affect um, of the tariff that shows, and that tariff is very, very high regardless, okay? If there's a high level of loss aversion, however, if that, that curve back in that psychological diagram is really steep, if it drops off very, very sharply, um, then you get something actually quite different. And, and you get a very low tariff again um, if prices are stable. If prices spike um, and consumer losses do not affect the elite's power, you'd expect a high tariff to be put on place. You'd expect a tariff that would be very high, much, much more, um, much larger, if um, consumer losses actually do affect the elite's power. So this, this uh, loss aversion does have a significant impact on um, the kind of behavior that you would expect. 
Okay, so that's the that's what this part of the analysis was trying to sh to illustrate was that um, we would expect that that. Um, like, so, um, what's the fit then with observed outcomes? Um, this is a, a, a different diagram than what we had before. Um, this starts in January of 08, just as the price spike was, was taking off. And um, th this, uh, what I want to show you, you here is that this actually matches very closely to um, these um, outcomes on this um, uh, on those charts. Um, what you see here, this is um, the export price. This is the price that um, um, Vietnam can get for its um, rice. Um, this price here is essentially the domestic price. Um, this is the price inside the country. Um, and you can see um, that what's happened is that they've been able to keep this um, domestic price from spiking up. Um, and this is uh, entirely because of, 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 um, of, a, of an export ban. Um, and this really, if you want to think about this, uh, the height of this bar, that's actually this export tariff that um, we modeled in the previous, um, 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 in, in the model itself. Okay. So what we see happening is um, Vietnam putting on, just as the world price is spiking, um, they're putting on a, a larger and larger um, tariff, um, essentially, on that um, grain, um, that rice going out of the country. All right. So um, this gives us um, a little bit of um, confidence that our model um, starting from these assumptions actually gives us results that are reasonably um, in line with um, what um, we observed. And that would suggest that, that this kind of political economy framework with perhaps some psychological elements of consumers are probably important features in terms of explaining um, the behavior of, of rice exports. Um, one of the things that, you know, if you remember back, I had those, you know, different models uh, giving different expected results. One of the models that's, that's, you know, out there that people are, are using, if not to kind of predict what would uh, happen, um, people are saying, well, you know, it would be nice if, at least if this would be actually what did happen in the world. And um, what, what people, you know, saying would like, they would like to see happen is that government should actually be setting policy not in the way that we've described it, but rather um, government should be setting policy to kind of in the best interests of the Vietnamese population. Okay, and I won't go into all the details here, but what I'm really saying in this um, chart is that if this was the case, if the Vietnamese government was really making decisions that were in the best interests of all of Vietnam it wouldn't be giving the, the rents um, from an export ban to the food companies. They would be taking it in as government revenue um, and then using it, say, to turn around and subsidize um, um, food prices to consumers, for instance. Okay? Um, and so this alone is one of the predictions that would come out of, so that's one of the predictions that would come out of this kind of behavior um, and that doesn't fit with what we observe at all. Um, and so I feel fairly confident in rejecting this as a set of assumptions that's driving behavior. This is not how um, the government in Vietnam is operating. They're not operating to um, sort of in the best interests of, of the Vietnamese population. Uh, because if they were, they'd be behaving in a very, very different um, way. Okay. So what can we expect in the future? Um, and th there's a couple of points to this. Um, we've been over this before. What we're seeing here is that an attempt to try to stabilize their own um, price for purposes that are solely um, related to the elite's objective function. We, um, exporting countries, in this case Vietnam, exacerbated of these international price spikes, okay? 
um, at precisely those times when uh, the prices are going up. Um, and um, as, a, as a consequence, um, while these restrictions alleviate food security concerns inside these countries, they make them worse in the importing countries like the Philippines and Malaysia and, um, and so forth. Um, unfortunately, um, we can expect this kind of behavior to continue. Okay? Um, the political economy um, in these country, in, in Vietnam, and this is, I'm, I'm gonna just stick with Vietnam for a second, um, makes it, for all the reasons that I've outlined, makes it very unlikely that you're going to see something different happen, at least for, uh, for a while. Um, and the reason is these elites have power and these, um, these kinds of policy changes are attempts by these elites to retain that power. Okay? Um, and so what you're seeing here is a self-reinforcing mechanism um, by the elites. They're not just earning rents, they're also playing this game to make sure that they um, uh, remain in power. Um, the other thing that, that these um, elites have going for them is that these um, policies have been in place for a very, very long time and they have become institutionalized. Um, and this is the, the, the point of that larger conversation about um, the nature of these um, state-owned enterprises um, operating um, in various parts of the Vietnamese economy. Um, and um, this point here, this, this um, <coughs> entrenchment um, has, uh, um, I think, some obvious and some serious repercussions for the Vietnamese economy, for market stability, and for global um, food security. Um, unfortunately, I think international price volatility can be expected um, to persist. These, when these spikes come, and they will come, um, they will... Uh, be severe um, for exactly the same reasons that they've been severe um, in the past. Um, and um, uh, this will have uh, impacts on the people that are um, unfortunately um, the least able to, um, to deal with them. Um, the, before I just end off here, um, I want to go back to um, that little chart where I said, you know, you start with a model, you build some assumptions, you see whether or not, you see what its predictions are, see if those predictions then fit with um, the observed, um, uh, ob the things that are actually being observed. And then you go back and say, does this model um, work then as a way of explaining something beyond this particular case? And so the, we've, we've made the case for Vietnam, okay? but. But then you have to go back and take a look at that list of countries that have been putting on export bans in the last 10 years. And at least for me, the question is, of those countries, does, is, which of those countries um, does this model also apply to? Okay. Does it apply to India? Um, does it apply to Thailand? Does it apply to, this, uh, to Russia? Does it apply to Argentina? Okay. And one would need to go through the kind of analysis that, that Travis and I went through for Vietnam to be able to um, answer that. But my first blush um, take on that is that I think, unfortunately, um, something like this is at work in all of those countries. The, the story will be slightly different, um, and one would need to really understand the institutions in each of those countries, but roughly something um, similar is going on. All those countries share characteristics, say, characteristic scores of polity to um, the World Bank um, um, ranking system, the, the, the corruption scores, um, and uh, unfortunately, probably all are subject to um, elites that are probably playing um, similar type games within their economies. So this doesn't paint a very good picture in terms of um, alleviating that um, but I do, I do think, and I'm going to go back to Morris's point right at the very beginning, I think it does say this is a, a, a key area that we're really going to have to focus on if we want to um, deal with food security 
Um, we have to get the agronomic part right, we have to get the science right, but we also have to work on these institutions worldwide if we're going to get um, this problem um, solved. So with that, thank you. <laughs>